Hello folks, welcome quite literally to Jim's Garage. Now, off the bat, I must apologize for the videography on this one. Um, as you can see, it's not exactly conducive to having this filmed. I didn't put this in a position that would make for good filming, so apologies for that. But anyway, let's dive straight into it. So I'm gonna talk you through my rack, and I'm gonna focus firstly on the servers and then we'll get onto some of the infrastructure. Some of which you can see quite handily just against the wall, which isn't ideal. We'll get onto that in a bit. But just to set the scene, I've not been living here that long, so hence why it's in a mess. And I'm trying to get out of jail here with my cabling. So I was keen to show you this in its raw form because I see a lot of pristine racks that are on the internet, etc. And that's fine, good for those guys, but I like to think mine is a bit more living and breathing. And I think that that home lab shame, we need to get rid of that. This is a healthy home lab. It's being used. I'm constantly tweaking it and I'm constantly playing. So let's go through what I've got. I'll talk to you about some of the stuff that's actually running on there. And then we'll get on to discuss some of the things that I want to do and hence why it's kind of in the state that it is. So before the worst game show host in history continues that physical home lab tour, I wanted to set some context first. So on screen, you can see on the right hand side, I've got my Proxmox environment. And this comprises of two physical nodes. This is my Dell R730 server and my Asus desktop workstation setup, i.e. the little brother. So this one here you can see is running a number of VMs and so is this one. And you can control both through the same Proxmox interface, which is really handy. Now, as I've said before, I run Kubernetes primarily, and all of the nodes here with the K3S in the title, those are part of my Kubernetes setup. So one, two, and three, those are deliberately split. Those are for the management and control plane. Four and five, and again, importantly, those are the workers, so that's where all the containers sit. Those are on separate nodes as well for redundancy. The last three are my Longhorn ones, and those are for persistent storage in a Kubernetes environment. So that's replicated storage on different machines, which is really important for failover because those containers need to have access to that data. Now, the important thing here is on the left. So this is my Rancher, which is a Kubernetes interface. So K3S is made by Rancher, and this is the Rancher UI, and Longhorn is also created by Rancher. And if you look closely in the second column, you can see all of the names, so all of the nodes are available. So this is where I have a single pane of glass to manage all my K3S nodes on separate physical Proxmox machines. So as I'm going through that physical walkthrough, just bear in mind this setup that you can see on screen. On top of that, I've got a Docker VM. So I primarily use this for hardware pass through. So my Coral TPU and my Zigbee device. Because I don't have two, so I can't put one on each node. I could technically pin containers to nodes and label them so that they just stay on the one machine. Um, I probably will do that in the future. I just haven't got around to it yet. Other than that, the only other important thing to realize for this video are the Sophos XGs. You can see I've got the passive on my smaller machine and I've got the active, i.e. the one that's currently running now, um, on my Dell, which is kind of the one that has the most horsepower. So hopefully you can bear that in mind while you're watching it and I'll now pass back to my handy assistant. See you soon. So if we start from the top, I've actually got an empty 1U here. So this used to house what you can see on the floor, which is now my second Proxmox node. But the problem with the One U is I ran out of space. So it can only house one PCIe slot. So that didn't really work for me. So I'm probably gonna spin that up as maybe a second smaller NAS, maybe with NVMe drives for some high performance. Um, maybe a third Proxmox node for disaster recovery, but it's kind of that trade-off where I've gone for two Proxmox nodes. I know you should have three to be Cora. But because I'm running Kubernetes, I kind of had failover between the two and trying to be cost efficient, power efficient, etc. cetera. Um, that feels like the right balance for me at the moment. Maybe that will change in the future. So that's just an empty case. 
down here is probably the one that's the most exciting. This is a Dell R730. Um, it has 15 SSD slots in the front, of which I'm only using two. And those two are a RAID mirror for the, um, the Proxmox boot installation. So none of the VMs actually run off those SSDs. It's purely for Proxmox itself and things like ISO images, etc. Now in this server, I've got a quad NVMe. So those are in a RAID 10, so two stripe mirrors effectively, which gives me high throughput. Now I've got Gen 4 drives. I've actually got some um, Fire CUDA 530s in there. Um, and that's a bit wasted because this is only Gen 3, but at the time, Gen 3s and Gen 4s were pretty much the same price, so it was a good fit. Also in there, I've got a load of 10 gig networking, which you can see from my switch. We'll get onto that in a minute. I've actually got a quad 10 gig in there, and it's in the proprietary form factor for this server, which is not great because I can't really use it outside of this style of server, but it is good because you can get it at secondhand enterprise rates. So <laughs> swings and roundabouts, I guess. Um, I do have also a load of Mellanox Connect X3 cards, and there's one in this server down here. So if ever that were to fail or I move servers, I'm not going to lose 10 gig networking. I can reuse those cards again. Um, also within my Dell, and this is my um, probably kind of the, the workhorse of my Kubernetes installation. So like I say, I've got Kubernetes distributed across these two nodes. And this has got dual 10 core processors, so it gives me th so it gives me 40 threads. Um, and this does pretty much all of the heavy lifting for Kubernetes. That one down there can do most of what I need it to, but it will struggle on some of those more intensive tasks like transcoding, etc. But it should be able to keep my home lab up just for the, the most important things. Um, what else is in there? Um, so my Coral TPU for Frigate, if you haven't watched that video, check it out. That is mounted to a PCIe card within this server. Um, and I've also got uh, my USB in the back. Um, I don't think you can see it, but there's a dongle at the back and that controls Zigbee, which is for all of these lights that are in this room. And pretty much the rest of the house's lights and a few other sensors. So they all connect back here. Uh, moving on down, um, this is actually a really old machine. It's about seven, eight years old now. Um, and this is my son's gaming PC slash my Proxmox test bench. And a lot of the stuff I do for these videos is actually run on here. So things like the double GPU pass through, that was actually done on this machine because it's got a consumer grade Intel CPU. And it's also got that Intel Arc A380. So I can play around with a lot of that cool stuff on there. Other than that, it's just a bog standard consumer grade CPU, um, consumer grade motherboard, um, no fancy networking. It's just got a standard one gig port in the back. Moving down, it gets a little bit more interesting. So this is my NAS. Um, there are 15 hard drives in there. It gives me a total storage of about 100 terabytes. Um, I started out with eight eights uh, and then I've suddenly needed to expand to a further six sixteens and it gives me a hundred uh, usable. I'm using both of those two VDEVs um, in a RAIDS 2 configuration um, and I do recommend RAIDS 2 because I have had another drive fail on a resilvering, so a rebuild of an already failed drive, which meant that I no longer had any redundancy. And so for any of you guys out there who are thinking, I'm just gonna go RAIDS 1, do understand that if you're doing that rebuild and another drive fails, you're gonna get data loss, which is a big no-no. And in there, believe it or not, is just, it's a Pentium. <laughs> so it's a dual core Pentium. Um, it's a G4560. Um, which actually I used to be able to do a lot of 4K transcoding on, but now it's in my TrueNAS, I don't want to use it for that. Um, there's 32 gigs of ECC RAM and there's a 10 gig networking card in there. So 
I get around seven to eight hundred megs copy speed on this machine, which is which is pretty good for my network. Um, the sad thing is my, my gaming PC here and the one that I do a lot of this recording on um, doesn't have a 10 gig card and we've all seen the problems with my setup before where I've got the Stream Deck card hanging out the back because it's only a mini ITX board. Um, otherwise in there it's just a standard Noctua cooler um, with a load of Noctua fans that keep it nice and cool. Um, this board has pretty much been on for six years now. Um, and I've only had a couple of drives fail, which I think is pretty good for that number of drives. Uh, moving down, um, this is probably the best thing you can ever get in a home lab, or certainly in a rack. Um, it's just a drawer. Um, and it has loads of important stuff in there. Um, and also loads of cables and things, all that kind of stuff. Backup USBs, things like that. At the bottom of the rack... Um, is a massively over spec a bit like the rack itself. This is a 3000 watt UPS. Looking down here, uh, my current total power draw is 350 watts. Um, taking into account this is on as well, um, which is pretty good, I think. And when I have the power flipped off, this will last me usually, I mean, the, the batteries are quite old now, so it will give me about 35 to 45 minutes of power, which is perfect. It's just enough time to sort of log in, turn it off, get me a bit of time to say, well, do I think the power's going to go on in the next 10 minutes? Can we bother to turn it all off? You get the idea. Down here is the second um, node in my Proxmox cluster. And there's really nothing exciting about this. It's an old workstation. So it's just a, it's just a quad core um, Xeon. I think it's a V6, but um, it's nothing exciting. It's the equivalent to something like a 6600K, 7700K, something like that. Um, it's got 32 gigs of RAM in it. It's non-ECC. Um, and like I say, I just have that as my second Proxmox node. Um, I don't have VM failover because I don't have the three Proxmox nodes and it's just not configured that way. What I do have is lots of... Um, nodes on my Kubernetes, i.e. workers and um, control planes, etc. So that I've got redundancy baked into that. So that's kind of the option I went for. In an ideal world, I would have both. But for me, it's just not worth it. Maybe in the future, I'll do that. Um, so I think I've demonstrated before in one of my live streams where I was able to turn off my main server and actually my whole home lab and stream stayed up. If you haven't seen that, I'll link it. Um, but that leads quite nicely on to what do I use some of these services for and also the networking. So a common theme in my lab is it's pretty over spec for what I need. And this switch is a direct example of that. So just above the switch, I've got um, a patch panel. And this patch panel is your standard punch down. So you put bare wire into the back and you punch it in. Um, and a few other things are connected there. I think it's just my IP cameras that go outside, my Unify G3 flexors. Um, and then those go into the switch, which is a PoE switch, and those are PoE cameras, so that's all good. Um, and below it, I've got the opposite patch panel, which is just a RJ45 pass-through, so you plug a standard Ethernet cable in the back, and then you just get to tidy it up with these little white ones, which are just Unify ones. So the switch itself um, is the USW48 Pro. Um, it's a really good switch. I've never had any issues with this. It's been a dream to work with. The only problem is it's a bit tight on the 10 gig. And the only reason I went for this size at the time, um, I was a bit of a noob, and it was the only one that had sort of the quad 10 gig ports on it. Um, plus I thought at the time I'd need a whole lot more networking, which never came to fruition. Um, so probably the most interesting thing about this is the fact that port one is actually my internet. And so my internet is going into my switch. Now you might be thinking, what the hell's going on there? And that's a good question. Typically my internet would go into my firewall, but I operate two firewalls. There's one firewall down there, which is the backup. And there's the primary firewall, which is on my Dell. So in this case, the internet is going into port one, 
And ports 1, 2 and 3 on the Switch are all part of the same VLAN. And that VLAN has nothing else on it other than it's my WAN VLAN. So basically the internet comes into one and ports two and three go into the respective WANs on the firewall. So they're basically sharing that internet connection. So you might be thinking, well, that's stupid, James. You don't have redundancy throughout your whole network. You've got one ISP and you've got one switch. And that's totally right. And I'm fully aware of that. But the cool thing it gives me is, like I say, I can switch down one of my physical nodes for maintenance everything including the internet is going to fail over to the other node so i can take this offline i can do hardware upgrades i can reboot it and usually there's a couple of seconds where it needs to fail over um, but that's it in terms of internet outage and that gets the big thumbs up from the wife and the rest of the family that the internet stays up and yeah that's saved my life so many times so that's basically what that's for and i'm going to be covering um ha firewall in the future and I think that'll be a really good video because I run Sophos, but you could basically do this with things like PFSense, OpenSense. Um, sadly, not Unify. I don't think they do HA. Um, but there's other firewall vendors out there as well that do, but they usually come with an enterprise license. Um, other than that, hardware-wise, it's not too exciting. I've got two... Um, Unify access points, one that's conveniently located there, which I just haven't got around to fitting it yet. Um, and the other one is actually fitted properly um, at the other end of my house. And that's a U6 Pro, one of the newer ones with Wi-Fi 6. Um, and if you look up here, this horrible mess of wires, um, those give me ethernet throughout the rest of the house. Now, I'm the only nerd in the house, so no one else is actually using that at the moment. But it does power one of the uh, one of the Wi-Fi points I've got over there, um, and I do have a few breakouts throughout the rest of the rooms, and also one of those is obviously the internet that's coming into this room. So that probably leads quite nicely into what I've got for future plans. Well, I want to get rid of this box down here. Um, I would like a backup that's a bit more 21st century. I'm looking very much forward to seeing what comes out with the 14th gen Intels. Those look crazy powerful and even from a GPU perspective. So I'd love to have, it's going to have to be a consumer one, um, but a consumer based second node for my Proxmox that's really energy efficient and is going to give me some good graphics performance because unfortunately this being a server, um, I could get a GPU in there and everything. Um, but a lot of the GPUs, certainly the Intel one I've got, they idle at like 20 to 30 watts, which is just a bit of a waste of power, really. So if I can get something that's on board on the CPU, to me, that iGPU approach just, just makes a lot more sense. Um, eventually, I'm going to want to change this Dell R730 as well. Um, some of the second gen epics are looking really good right now. And I'm excited to see where Threadripper goes uh, and what comes out in that space. Power is obviously going to be the key thing, but I know they're going to be bloody expensive as well. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. So it's quite a humble home lab. It's an absolute mess of a home lab. But in some ways, I hope that that comforts you from the fact that it doesn't have to look pretty. <laughs> it should look better than this. But also more from the fact that you don't need to have rows and rows of servers to do some of the, I like to think, relatively complex setup that I have, certainly around the Kubernetes. Um, and, and I think that's great because people can access it and if, afford it. And, and that's really important to get people engaged in this hobby and just learn it and take it back to work, right? Next videos, um, we're going to slowly start getting into Kubernetes. I want to cover off um, a whole host of the ones that you guys have got on the want list. Um, and I've got a few that I want to cover, but eventually we're going to be moving on to things like dual firewall setups, um, full Kubernetes clusters, uh, and I can't wait to bring you guys along on that journey. So thanks for watching, everybody. Um, please let me know what your thoughts are, any questions you've got. I'd go over them. Any improvements you think that I can make, I'd love to hear it. Anyway, take care, everybody. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care, everybody.